Therefore it says, wake up, sleeper. Get up from the dead. Christ will shine on you. So be careful to live your life wisely, not foolishly. Take advantage of every opportunity because these are evil times. Because of this, don't be ignorant, but understand the Lord's will. Saints of God, our eyes have seen the glory and the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the village with the grapes of wrath of storm. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I see him in the watch fires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening doing dance. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamp. His day is marching on. I'm from the Cheyenne River, Lakota Reservation in South Dakota. And early on in my life, I started to learn about our old ways of prayer through our sacred sweat lodge and different ceremonies that I participated in. Growing up on the reservation, not everything Tony Buffalo learned about the Christian church was a positive experience. The parochial school she attended didn't respect her language or culture. I went to a Catholic school. Um, I experienced um, abuses at the hands of Catholic nuns. Our elders said, you know, they gave us this Bible and they took our land. The reservations were created. We were put on the land that nobody wanted. American Indians live on reservations today due to a 15th century principle of law still in practice called the Doctrine of Discovery. Created in the 1400s by the church and Christian monarchs, it allowed explorers to claim land and resources from indigenous peoples. This person called Columbus came and planted his flag and discovered North America. He did it on the basis of that edict. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act into law. It forced American Indians living on lands within state borders to relocate to unsettled areas west of the Mississippi, to reservations on barren lands in Congress with tribal ways of life. Many American Indians died during the forced relocation. The Cherokee Nation, for example, lost 4,000 people during its march west. Today, their march is known as the Trail of Tears. By the 1870s, President Ulysses S. Grant's peace policy encouraged Christian missionaries to set up schools to westernize indigenous populations. The policy allowed American Indian children to be taken away from their families and put into Indian boarding schools. 
the boarding school experiment, which I've said was a Hitler-esque experiment, has contributed to loss of language, loss of culture, loss of family stability, loss of the way of life, was really one of the main contributing factors to the cultural and physical genocide of the indigenous peoples in the United States. My husband, who is 56 years old, is the last generation that speaks our Lakota language fluently. 56. It wasn't just the language, then our spirituality was attacked. Our way of life, our medicines were attacked. All coming from this doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery is still being used today. It is woven into the fabric of United States law and has robbed American Indians of their land and natural resources. The doctrine also affects other indigenous peoples, including native Alaskans and native Hawaiians. In Hawaii, in January 1893, UCC predecessors, along with other missionaries and the United States, States government were complicit in overthrowing I'm not sure what's happening here. Uh oh, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, let's see here. Is this? The oh, shucks. Oh, bloody boy. Uh oh, let's see here. What's going on? What's going on? Mr. Charles, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um Okay. It seems like my whole system just began to. Well, everybody, it appears there was a technical difficulty with this stream. I'm not sure what happened. Um, I. So I'm assuming the host will be back on in a few moments. Uh, this is Brandon Davis's stream, Conversations with Faith Leaders.
and he has asked me to be a guest on here to talk about the doctrine of discovery but i think his computer system went down where he's hosting this from and so it's brought me up so i will wait here for a few minutes and see what happens next you may need to reschedule it i'm not sure what's what's going on exactly Okay, Mr. Charles, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, we're still connected. Uh, my apologies, everyone, for the interruption. I'm not exactly for certain what happened here, um, but preferably things will work out the way it's supposed to work out. I was hoping to continue the video, um, not for certain if it will continue to play, um, but we will see. Um, this video that I'm sharing with you was created by the United Church of Christ. Uh, it is from a conference that they hosted um, in regards to the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery, uh, which is vital for a point of context for our conversation today with Mr. Charles. So I'm going to see if the video will continue to play. If not, we will move forward with our questions. Uh, delighted to have with me today, Mr. Mark Charles, uh, who is the co-author of the doctrine of discovery, the ongoing uh, dehumanizing legacy uh, of the doctrine of discovery is called unsettling truths the ongoing dehumanizing legacy of the doctrine of discovery and so uh i'm delighted to have him with us let me see if the video will continue to play and we will move on from there including native alaskans and native hawaiians in Hawaii, in January 1893, UCC predecessors, along with other missionaries and the United States government, were complicit in overthrowing the Hawaiian monarchy. It was a move that resulted in the loss of native language and culture. In 1993, on the 100th anniversary of the event, the United Church of Christ apologized and offered redress. We stand before you, we of the United Church of Christ, to repent of wrongs done na ka na ka mali by the United Church of Christ. And we stand before you this day to commit ourselves anew to do with you that which we can to right those wrongs to build a society with you of peace and justice, to help right those wrongs that hurt and that harm. The delegates of General Senate 29 voted overwhelmingly to repudiate the doctrine of discovery. Today, the United Church of Christ urges congregations to learn more about the doctrine and speak out against it. Churches are also encouraged to build relationships with indigenous peoples and support their rights. American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians have patiently waited and are still patiently waiting. It is the responsibility of people that have settled here to know and meet and come to an understanding of who we are as indigenous people. We might have something to add to your walk of life. We might have something that maybe we could share together. Ladies and gentlemen, I have with me Mr. Mark Charles, the co-author of The Unsettling Truths, The Ongoing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. Uh, please welcome him with us. Mr. Mark Charles is a man of Navajo and Dutch descent. He is a speaker, writer, and consultant on the complexities of American history, race, culture, and faith. He has served on the boards of the CCDA and the Christian Reformed Church, and he lives with his family in Washington, D.C., and in 2020, he was a presidential candidate uh, for president of the United States of America. 
Mr. Charles, I'm delighted to have you with me today. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here. Well, thank you very much for having me. If I could just introduce myself briefly. Um, yes, please. So, Yat E, Mark Charles, Yinishia, Tsin Bakay Dinan Nishle, Dotoy Huglini Bashis Jean, Tsin Bakay Dinan Dasha Che, Dotoy Chini Dashanella. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Tsin Bakay Dinan. Loosely translated, it means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bakay And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also want to acknowledge I'm speaking to you from what's now known as Washington, D.C. And these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. I moved here with my family from the Navajo Nation about seven years ago, and I want to honor the Piscataway as the host people of the land where I now live. The Piscataway, they were the nation that they were living here and hunting here, farming here and fishing here, raising their families here and burying their dead here long before Columbus got lost at sea, and they're still here. I've had the honor of meeting some of the Piscataway. I've been to a land welcoming by the Piscataway. I want to honor them as the host people of these lands. And I want to just publicly state how humbled I am to be living on these lands today. Oh, Mr. Charles, thank you for that. Thank you for putting that in context for me and my listeners. Uh, it is such a blessing to be able to be informed of the truth. And that is the purpose of this conversation. Uh, that I try to have with different guests uh, is to have factual, real information uh, shared with those who are listening. And thank you for that brief history moment because many of us are ignorant to the truths that uh, the lands in which we inhabit today were not discovered by Christopher Columbus. Yeah. These lands existed before he ever got lost at sea. And so again, thank you for that. I want to ask you as our first uh, question, what have Mark Charles been doing since your presidential bid? Well, so I ran for president in 2020 because I wanted to challenge our nation to wrestle with its history, right? We were founded on this heretical Christian doctrine known as the doctrine of discovery. It's been embedded into our foundations. Um, and it really is the root of a lot of the challenges we face, especially both racially and um, in terms of, uh, of um uh, uh, sexism and things like that in our country, and yet we've never dealt with them. And so I ran, I've been talking about these issues probably for the past 20, 25 years of my life. And I, I ran at, for, for president to help our nation wrestle with them. Um, the theme of my campaign was to build a nation where for the very first time, we the people might actually mean all the people. And one of the primary planks of my platform was that our, our country, the United States of America, needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. Something on par with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that took place in, in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. But I did not refer to what we need as truth and reconciliation, because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony, which is not accurate. So I talked about our need for truth and conciliation. And that was one of the primary planks of my platform. Conciliation is merely the mediation of a dispute. Let's acknowledge the past was bad and let's just start moving forward to try and make it better. And so I, in a lot of ways, the campaign did elevate the, the conversation higher than it was previously, but it did not get things to the national level like I had hoped. And so since the campaign ended, um, I've continued to work to kind of move the conversation forward. I've done a lot of work to promote the book I co-authored on Settling Truth, which came out during the campaign uh, in 2019. And uh, I'm, I'm continuing to speak and to write. I actually am very active on social media, uh, talking about these issues, both politically, socially, uh, re religiously. And what do we need to do as a nation to kind of press forward and to move forward? 
Um, so yeah, on my social media, pretty much you, my, my name is wireless Hogan pretty much everywhere online. I do things what I'm, my second cup of coffee is something I do two or three times a week where I sit down right in this very space and I drink my second cup of coffee of the day and talk about the politics, the social issues, uh, the, the religious issues of the day and what do we need to do to reframe them? In fact, one of the conversations I've been having even just this past week is our need to teach white America, the truth about Juneteenth and how we need to make sure that conversation as our nation is starting to celebrate Juneteenth as a national holiday, we have to make sure it doesn't become a kind of a sterilized myth that doesn't actually deal with our nation's history, but actually say, no, there's things about Juneteenth we must recognize and acknowledge so that we can both honor it correctly and deal properly with our own history as a nation. So one of the myths that are coming out right now about Juneteenth is that Juneteenth marked the end of slavery, which isn't true. Juneteenth marked the day that the Emancipation Proclamation reached the final Confederate, Confederate state of Texas. But there are actually two Union states, Delaware and Kentucky, that had not seceded from the Union, and they continued to practice legal slavery until six months after Juneteenth. And so it's ironic that the Union, right, the Northern states had enslavement of African people longer than the Confederate states did. And by claiming that slavery ended on Juneteenth, 1865, is not only inaccurate, it doesn't help our nation to deal with the fact that enslavement was not just a Southern Confederate issue. It was a bipartisan North and South. It was an American issue that we have to learn how to deal with corporately, together, communally, and not just have a scapegoat and say, okay, now we've got rid of the Confederate States, we, we won the Civil War, and so now we're fine as a nation. And that's actually not true at all. So that's really what I've been doing both before and now after the campaign of how do we continue to press these conversations so that our nation can really wrestle with the history that we're standing on. Mr. Charles, let me say, uh, <laughs> Uh, you have articulated the things that have been on my mind. Um, um, after the federalization of Juneteenth, I wrote an article um, uh, that was published in the Christian Recorder, uh, which is the oldest uh, still in continuation of print uh, newspaper owned by African-Americans. Um, the article was called Shining Brass and Tinkling Symbols, uh, the federalization of uh, Juneteenth. And um, I did receive some uncomfortable uh, commentary uh, from a few uh, friends because I do not share a lot of my family and friends appreciation for Juneteenth. Um, and and I don't say it in a jovial way, but I, I don't yeah. want to celebrate uh, getting late news uh, because that's essentially what it was. Um, for me, it was yeah. late news. Uh, and it did nothing for the reality of the thousands upon thousands of black people that were still held in perpetuity of slavery um, that we that we later you know referred to uh, as sharecropping. Mm -hmm. And so uh, having those conversations and to hear you talk about that is 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 just further reason why I'm glad to have you here. And also, as I said back uh, in, in in our backstage. Um, your book was helpful to me in the pandemic um, because it helped me to put into perspective some of the questions that I already had in my mind. Um, when when I came through school, we were told that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Mm -hmm. We were told that Christopher Columbus founded the Americas. We were told that uh, there was nothing here until he got here. And so we made uh, in elementary, there was songs that were sung. Uh, when we jump rope, there were uh, plays put on about the founding of America. Um, but as I got older and became a student of history, um, it became very interesting to me how this narrative um, got spread. But the truth was Christopher Columbus got lost and he was found by the native people living on these lands. Um, Howard Zinn writes heavily uh, in his now reclaimed book that has been 
uh, republished and brought back to life uh, his history of America. Uh, yeah. And then having your book, uh, you and Mr. Um, Su Chan Ra, um, having your book come out allowed us seminarians, I should say, to be able to put into perspective the answers we've been looking for that this wasn't just white people waking up and creating this stuff. Yeah. This wasn't just Andrew Jackson waking up one day and saying, hey, let's move the Cherokee Nation off these lands that they've been on all of their life. Yeah. Uh, let's move them on the Trail of Tears somewhere else. This was all started because of a 14th, 15th century document called the Doctrine of Discovery. Yes. Yeah, that is absolutely true. And one of the things I, I work very hard, both in this book as well as in my work, is to offer a bipartisan critique, right? What, one of the challenges we face in our country is because of our very simplistic political system, which is a two-party system, it creates every dialogue binary. And all we then do is scapegoat the opposing party and blame all the problems on, on, on those people and say, if we just they didn't do what they were doing, then we would be exceptional as a whole. And well, you know, the, what the challenge is, is so many of our problems are actually deeply held by partisan values held by both the left and the right conservatives and liberals. And until we can acknowledge that, we're never going to deal with um, the problems. You know, there, there's several ways we point this out in our book. One of the most um, primary ways is, is when we look at in chapters 9 and 10 of Unselling Truths, where we look at the mythological legacy of Abraham Lincoln. Yes. Right? Where we have this mythology in our country that Lincoln loved Black people, was fighting for their equality, and abolished slavery. And nothing could be further from the truth. By his own admission, Abraham Lincoln was a blatant white supremacist who couldn't give a crap about black people. His primary object, as he stated, hanging in the Lincoln Memorial, was to save the Union, and he could do it regardless of what happened to black people. And when he, uh, when he, whether it was writing the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th Amendment of Abolishing Slavery, he actually didn't free everyone in either place, right? The Emancipation Proclamation only freed enslaved peoples in the South, in the Confederate States, and the 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. The clause keeps it legal in our criminal justice system, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. And then on top of that, right, and in, in, this is in 1862, he signs two bills, one which is the uh, Homestead Act, which allows American citizens to go west and homestead for five years and get 160 acres of land. And the second was the Pacific Railway Act, which provided land and resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway. After two years of signing those two acts, and after the hanging of the Dakota 38 and the removal of the Dakota and Winnebago from Minnesota, after um, the Sand Creek Massacre, after the Navajo Long Walk, and after the removal of the Shoshone and the massacre of the Shoshone and the Bear River Massacre in Idaho, um, he literally has ethnically cleansed the primary routes of the Transcontinental Railway. Abraham Lincoln was one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history, and yet we celebrate him like he was a savior of people of color and of our nation and nothing could be further from the truth so wow. there's so much we have to you know we have to have a critique of this is a bipartisan core american values that we're wrestling with and if we don't deal with it at that level we're never going to solve it just by scapegoating someone on the fringes or on the side of one political party or the other Ladies and gentlemen, this is why I have been excited to have this conversation with uh, Mark Charles, because, um, again, he and his companion, Sue Chan Ra, uh, the authors of Unsettling Truths, they give to you a huge crash course of information about how we got to the place that we are 
in the United States as it relates to white supremacy, racism, the taking of lands that were owned by nations of people who lived here years and years and years before any idea of the colonies or America was ever conceived in anyone's mind. So brothers and sisters, uh, I hope that you are enjoying this conversation. I am in class. Let me recognize uh, Mr. Larry Sutton, uh, who was my high school history teacher. Uh, Mr. Larry Sutton taught uh, history at Clinton High School, Go Dark Horses. And uh, he is also my fraternity brother. Uh, I'm proud to have followed in his footsteps. Um, and as a sophomore, Mr. Charles, uh, I was allowed to uh, take his African-American history class, which was an honors class um, at Clinton High School, uh, which uh, I should say for context, Clinton High School, um, for the most part, is predominantly white. Um, However, there was a large Native American population at Clinton High School. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I loved about uh, my Native brothers and sisters in Clinton, um, they knew who they were and they owned it. They lived their culture loud, uh, proud, and uh, not too far from Clinton High School uh, was a church um, that was their church. It was a Pentecostal church. And let me tell you, it was one of the jumpingest Pentecostal churches I ever attended in the Clinton area. If you wanted to have great church, you wanted to go to that church. You wanted <laughs> to attend that church. Any day of the week, any Sunday of the month, that's where you wanted to be. And so I'm grateful to have my uh, high school teacher here who allowed me to take that class as a sophomore. You had to be an upperclassman, a senior, uh, to take African-American history. But I had taken all of the history classes that I was supposed to have taken. And so I was glad to be able to do that. And so uh, again, I'm just so grateful to have you with me. Uh, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't already purchased the book, Unsettling Truths, go to Amazon, but you can also, I'm going to put the link here uh, in the comments so you all can have access to it. I'm going to put it on the page in just a second. You can get signed copies of Unsettling Truths um, that Mr. Mark Charles co-authored with San Chan Ra, uh, Su Chan Ra, you can get copies, and I'm going to post the link in just a second. I want to ask you uh, this question before we take a, a break for our sponsor. What were the inspirations for you writing and selling troops? The inspiration. So, I mean, there were so many things. I've been I've been speaking and and writing about this topic for a very long time, um, you know, for many years, and I wasn't quite ready to write a book about it. I was good friends with my co-author Sing Chan Ra. And he has written many books. He was a, 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 a seminary professor at North Park Seminary in Chicago. He just moved this past year. He's now a professor at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, California. And he's written many books. Uh, one of his better known books is the next, the next Evangelicalism. He also is the author of this book, which is called A Prophetic Lament. I have that book. And he talks about how the, the American church, the Western church, is really anemic at the spiritual discipline of lament. And he was actually finishing up that book and beginning to promote it. And I was speaking about the doctrine of discovery and we were doing a lot of things on the same stage all around the country. Oftentimes we would speak back to back and I got to know his speech about lament very well. And he heard my talk on the doctrine of discovery many times over. And we realized that there was a, a, a deep synergy between our two messages. Um, I was actually calling people to lament, and he was showing how our church is not very good at lament. And so finally, one day he said, Mark, we should really write a book together. And because he had been through the process many times himself, I had never written a book before. We sat down. He whipped out a proposal. We uh, kind of came up with a framework for the book. We submitted it to some publishers. We got two offers from, from different publishers about publishing it. We decided to go with InterVarsity Press. And we were off and running. Um, and so uh, we took five years to write the book. Um, there's many stories we share about the challenges we face of trying to write this book. Um, and there were so many times where I literally had to stop and lament and just kind of acknowledge the brokenness we were writing about so that I could even just continue writing. Um, and the book started out, originally it started out as a call to lament. We were calling the church 
into the, the discipline of lament over its complicity in the doctrine of discovery. But after the 2016 election, where Western Christianity and specifically the white evangelical church in America was responsible for the election of Donald Trump, we actually sat down and we reframed our book. And instead of it being a call to lament, we reframed our book as a direct public rebuke of the church. Um, and really we're, we're pointing out how the church was so complicit in this notion of Christian nationalism and the things that it has done in the past and is moving forward in the future that we decided we really need to have a public rebuke of the church. And that's essentially what on selling truth is. Um, now, of course, we have a bipartisan critique. And so our critique is that the, the, the Republican, the, the conservative part of the church, right? That's the explicit manifestation of these values. And the liberal and the democratic side of that, or the, 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 the liberal side, progressive side of the church, that is the implicit um, manifestation of these same values. But they both hold these same values. Um, and so we, uh, we decided to kind of reframe the book, but I am so deeply appreciative for my friendship with Sing Chan. I love the fact that um, all the things he brought into this book, um, whether it was his, his just academic, his rigorous academic research, as well as the components of lament and other critiques he brought specifically into this book, um, only made the book richer and, and much deeper than it would have been had I been authoring it just by myself. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of motivation, but the, the, the movement behind the book was to help our nation talk about these things that we don't know how to talk about. There's a quote I use frequently in the book and in my speeches and everywhere I go. It's a quote, it was used by George Erasmus, who was an indigenous leader in Canada. He is an indigenous leader in Canada. And when he was writing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there, he used this quote that says, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build community, you must start by creating a common memory. I love that quote because I think it gets to the heart of our nation's problem, especially regarding race, Absolutely. which is we don't have a common memory. Absolutely. And so that's what we're trying to do with this book is create this common memory so that we can, in the long run, build a healthier and better community. So let me ask you this question. Uh, my high school professor, uh, teacher, Mr. Larry Sutton asked, how familiar are you with the work of Equal Justice Initiative founded by Brian Stevens? I've had the honor of meeting Brian at one point. I love his work. I think what he does is incredibly valuable. And I would actually be very, I'm actually hoping to have a conversation with him sometime in the future to see what we can do together because I love his critique of our nation at a foundational level regarding its history with um, African American people and enslavement. Um, and I think that there's similar work that needs to be done in bringing things to the forefront uh, regarding our nation's history with Native Americans. And so, yeah, Brian is, I, I, I wish I could call him a friend. I haven't met him enough times to, to have a relationship with him, but I've met him once or twice. I really admire his work and I would love to do something together with him in the future. I want to quickly, before we uh, take a break for one of our sponsors, I want to quickly say that uh, your, I, I like the way you describe your work uh, as a public rebuke of the church, because when it comes down to one of the things I learned in the pandemic was that a lot of what we struggle with in terms of understanding how this conversation about racism got started, it has its roots deeply entangled with the Christian church. Um, a lot of the things that we preach and teach are rooted in a theological and biblical understanding that is totally far from the God that I believe in. Um, yeah. The Southern Baptist Church um, and 
everything that it stands for has its roots deeply tied to slavery. Um, I mean, one of the founders, one of the major founders, uh, uh, Basil Manley, I think his name was, um, one of the one of the proponents of the Southern Baptist Church, actually preached and argued and taught and wrote pamphlets and books that God put white people on this earth to tame the black man, uh, yeah. to civilize him, to give him a sense of God. There's a quote uh, that I love by Archbishop Desmond Tutu um, that he made uh, some years ago. It says, when the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes. When we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land. It, it, it speaks so much truth uh, yeah. on, on so many different levels as it relates to how we got to the place that we're in. Uh, the video that I shared, um, as it talked about how the missionaries went over to Hawaii and overthrew uh, a legacy, uh, a dynasty that existed for, yeah. for, for hundreds of years just because they thought that their culture and their way of living was wrong. Let us show you the right way to do it. And in doing so, we're gonna steal your land. We're gonna steal your heritage. We're gonna steal your culture. We're going to take your native tongue. We're going to take your customs. Um, and so much work is being done uh, through Native Americans and um, uh, Native Americans all over this country. So much work is being done to restore the culture, to restore the history, to restore the lands. And your book puts a lot of that in perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back uh, with our with our. Uh, guest, Mr. Mark Charles, author, co-author of Unsettling Truths. Praise him with a violin. Welcome. I'm Alphonse Allen, the senior pastor of Allen Temple AME Church. And I'm personal injury attorney Blake Maislin, partnering together to bring you the Allen Temple broadcast. Every Sunday morning at 1130 on Star 64, we're reaching the city one soul at a time. And now we're inviting you to join us every Sunday morning at 11.30 on Star 64. So we're back with Mark Charles, co-author of Unsettling Truths. And so, uh, Mr. Charles, I want to ask you this question. I've been waiting to ask you this question. Um, define the doctrine of discovery and what are its influences on today's society? Uh, <laughs> this is going to be exciting for those who are listening. Chris, uh, Reverend Chris Stewart, if you're listening, get your pen out because this is going to be something we'll talk about later on in our text three. Yeah, so the doctrine of discovery, it's a series of papal bulls are edicts of the Catholic Church. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and practice. The Doctrine of Discovery, it's essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever land you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. So this is the doctrine that allowed European nations to go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the people because they did not see them as human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this, in this new world, which was already inhabited by millions, and claim to have discovered it. Right? The first chapter, the first sentence of the first chapter of our book says you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can steal those lands, you can conquer those lands, you can colonize those lands. You can't discover them unless your implicit racial bias informs you that the people living there are not fully human. Now, the challenge with this doctrine is that this worldview gets embedded into our foundations. So our Declaration of Independence, right, which starts with this great statement, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal 
30 lines later, in the same declaration, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages, making it very clear the only reason the founding fathers used the inclusive term all men because they had a very narrow definition of who was actually human. So our Declaration of Independence, based on the Doctrine of Discovery, is a systemically white supremacist document. The Constitution, which begins with the terms we the people. Again, this sounds inclusive. But if you keep reading, right, when I ran for president, I told people, I said, if you think our Constitution was written to protect everyone, get into a diverse group and read the document out loud. You will be appalled at how quickly and blatantly it turned racist, sexist, white supremacist, and exclusive. Article 1, Section 2, the section of the Constitution that determines who is and who is not covered by this document, who is and who is not a part of this union. First of all, it never mentions women. It specifically excludes natives. And it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. In 1787, that leaves white men. And technically, it was white landowning men who could vote. We don't think about that frequently enough. The purpose of the Constitution, the reason it was written, was to keep, was, was to protect the interests of white landowning men. And this was affirmed, right, in 1857 with the Dred Scott decision. The Dred Scott decision, which concluded by the Supreme Court that Black people were not covered, were not protected by the Constitution. This was the debate in 1857, 1858. This is the debate that Abraham Lincoln stepped into when he was running for Senate. And he introduced himself nationally and he said, I have no intention to make voters or jurors of Negroes or allow them to hold office or to intermarry. There is a physical difference between the white and black races which forever forbid the two from living in terms of social and political equality. Right? He was stating, just like today, people have to take a side on Roe versus Wade and on others like that. In 1758, the politicians had to decide where did they stand on Dred Scott. And Abraham Lincoln, if you read the Lincoln-Douglas debates, repeatedly said he believes the Dred Scott decision was correct. And our founding documents were not written to protect black people. So we have to acknowledge that was the purpose they were written for. Then we have the Supreme Court, right? In 1823, there was a Supreme Court case. Two men of European descent, this is Johnson versus McIntosh, it's two men of European descent litigating over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from a native tribe, the other one got the same land from the government, and they want to know who owned it. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. So this is the John Marshall Court, and they had to determine the principle upon which land titles were built. In his opinion, John Marshall concludes that it is discovery that gives title to the land. And then he goes on to reference the doctrine of discovery and essentially says that even though natives were here first, but because they are savages, we only have what's called the right of occupancy to the land, like a fish would occupy water, a bird would occupy air. And Europeans have the right of discovery to the land, so they have the fee title to it, so they are the true title holders. That case in 1823 helps create the legal precedent for land titles. I gave a TEDx talk on that case, on these cases. Um, it's called We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. And the doctrine of discovery and the precedent from the 1823 case get referenced by the Supreme Court in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. I won't go through all the details of that case, but in my TEDx talk, I lay out how the 2005 case was probably one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime. Uses the exact same logic that John Marshall used in 1823. It references by name the doctrine of discovery, and it concludes that natives no longer have the right of sovereignty over their traditional lands. And that opinion was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Right? That, that TEDx talk, was that in 2019? 
That was in 2018. It came 2018. out. Yeah, December of 2018. December 2018. Okay, awesome. I want to make sure that I can have that to share with the people. Yeah, if you just look up Mark Charles, if you uh, Google Mark Charles TED Talk, you'll find it. Um, it's on the TED website as well as on the TEDx website. Um, it's been viewed over 200,000 times. But yeah, that that talk lays out the Doctrine of Discovery in 19 minutes in fairly good detail. Yeah, I want to make sure I can share that with everyone. So let me just say one of the struggles that I'm having today is that um, I, the conversation about Abraham Lincoln not being a proponent of freedom for black people uh, is not a new conversation, not for me. Uh, it is a conversation that I have had with colleagues and friends uh, numerous times. Um, however, for some reason, um, I have to admit that um, I'm struggling. Um, I have a, a heavy, a heavy painting of Abraham Lincoln that I'm going to have to take off my wall. Yeah. Um, and the only reason why I have it, I, I, I purchased the painting because of the quote, um, those who deny freedom to anyone do not deserve it themselves. Um, and for some reason I've had that painting on my walls for a very long time. But you you have you've made me a little uneasy today. There is um, a when you read so those two chapters, chapter nine and ten of this book, I yes. have continuously gotten feedback from people that those are two of the most eye-opening as well as the most difficult chapters to read. Very difficult to take in. Yes. And one of the things I do very specifically in that chapter is I I wrote that chapter and those chapters and framed them in a way where we didn't quote experts on Lincoln. We didn't quote, you know, historians and, and different historical um, ideas. We quoted Lincoln and we looked at his policies and what he did. And by his own admission, he was a blatant white supremacist. By his own admission, he was that. And then when you add on top his ethnic cleansing and genocidal actions towards native peoples he was at least on par if not worse than andrew jackson and one of the ways i frame that conversation is history is written by the victors so let's imagine for a moment right let's just imagine for a moment that nazi germany wins world war ii how would you imagine their history books would portray Adolf Hitler? Well, he'd be their greatest leader ever, right? He brought them yeah. from global scorn and obscurity to national global prominence. How would their history books frame the Holocaust? Well, we have Holocaust deniers today. Imagine if they won the war. What Holocaust? There was no Holocaust. This is exactly what our country did with Abraham Lincoln. When he was assassinated in 1865, my people, the Navajo people, were literally imprisoned in a death camp that was approved by Abraham Lincoln in New Mexico after we had been ethnically cleansed and herded down there by the U.S. Army in 1863 and 1864. My people were literally sitting in what can only be called a death camp where a quarter of our people who were imprisoned there died while imprisoned in that death camp when he was assassinated. These are the things we don't know how to talk about as a country. And I, I, one of the things we say in chapters, beginning in chapter nine, is one of the biggest challenges the United States of America has is we've never lost a war that matters. We've never had to give up large tracts of land. We've never had to surrender. We've never been disarmed. We've never had to endure the scorn of the global community. We've never had a regime change. And as a result of that, we have written our own history for 250 years. And much of that history is a mythology. And we're doing it today, right? We are literally writing the history today. Read the headlines. Look at what Joe Biden said when he made Juneteenth a national holiday. They said, we're, we're writing the mythology today that slavery ended on Juneteenth when it didn't. 
But by framing it that way, and by framing slavery ended when it ended in the Confederacy, even though it was still very alive and well in the Union, the Northern states, what it lets us do is it lets us scapegoat the Confederacy, which lost the war. And now the whole, the nation can say, and so equality won out and we were able to end slavery and the mythology can continue to go on because we now got rid of the subset. There's, there's a chapter in On Selling Truths talking about the myth of American exceptionalism. And one of the things we say is that American exceptionalism is the coping mechanism of a nation that's in deep denial of its genocidal past, as well as its current racist and sexist reality. The way our nation deals with our genocidal ethnic cleansing and enslaving history is we tell ourselves we're God's chosen people and we have promised lands. And when we create that narrative, right? Because if you read the book of Deuteronomy and Joshua, when God gives promised lands to the people of Israel, his command of what they, how they claim those promised lands is to kill everybody who lives there. Promised lands for one group of people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. There's another great book about the doctrine of discovery written by Stephen Newcomb, a wonderful native author. And his book is titled Pagans in the Promised Land. Because what are the Jewish people told to do to the pagans living in their promised land? Kill them. What did this nation do to the heathens living in their promised land? 96 to 98% rate of genocide from 1492 to 1870. 96% rate of genocide. You know, one of the one of the struggles um, for reading your book is that um, it it causes you to confront the dangers of bad rhetoric and narratives that influences so much of what is to be believed about American society, American history, and about the Christian church. Um, let me tell you, uh, I, I had, <laughs> I have the same exact feelings, uh, rather emotions that I had when I interviewed, um, um, I'm having a moment here. Um, Cousin Janet is what we started calling each other. Uh, one of the most proponent persons to talk about race and racism in America. Yeah. Um, she came on the show and she really just took up residence and just taught a whole new understanding about racism and white supremacy and hatred. Um, she she really she really uh, took me and the listeners to task. Um, and you're doing the same thing. I have these very feelings and, and, and it's a little different from talking, from reading the book and talking with you. Uh, and you do this with grace. Again, you do this with grace. Um, this is not ripping off a bandage. You, 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 you're, you, you, you kind of lay the truth on the table and it's like, you know, here, you choose what you want to believe, but Here's everything that you need to know to be informed and to make an informed, informative yeah. decision. And that's how you gave us that particular chapter on Abraham Lincoln. It was like, let me just hear. Yeah. Read it for yourself. You know, and I'm and I'm grateful because you've done uh how many weeks was it? Uh was it a three, six week, three to six week study on the book? You guys went chapter by chapter. Um uh, yeah, on your social media, uh, it was kind of like a Bible study, if you will, um, talking about your book, and and that's what you did. You you didn't just you didn't just give it to us and say, you know, Abraham Lincoln said this, and Abraham Lincoln said that. Um, you know, the Christian Church believes this, but the Christian Church does this. You gave us factual information that we can go and Google because. That's just who I am. I, yeah. I, I can't watch a historical movie because I got Google in my hand. I want to <laughs> know if these events really happen. So I got to rewatch a movie two or three times. Yeah. 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 We worked very hard to do that. And there, there's four chapters, the two chapters on Abraham Lincoln, which were a huge paradigm shift for many people. And then we have two chapters. It's chapters three and four. 
that talk about how the church got from the teachings of Jesus, who said things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, how we got from there to a doctrine of discovery that says you can now kill people who don't look like, worship like, act like, or speak like you. And those four chapters are really pivotal to kind of allowing your paradigm to be shifted. And we have as strong of a critique of, we have a very strong critique of, um, of St. Augustine in those chapters. And again, just like Abraham Lincoln, you don't lightly critique St. Augustine, right? Because because he's such a he's so revered in so much of the of the of the world, especially the Christian world. And so we did a very same approach with Augustine as we did with Abraham Lincoln, which is instead of quoting extensively experts on Augustine or experts on Lincoln, which would get us into a great historical or theological debate, we instead quoted Lincoln and quoted Augustine. And challenged our readers to wrestle with what they said and how those words played out in the historical context. And that was a very intentional choice we made because we didn't want to have just a, a theological debate that could distract people from the issue. We wanted to pe people to wrestle with what those historical figures actually didn't said so that we could actually move past it and, and get to a better place. So, um, my teacher, Mr. Sutton, uh, has asked a question of you. Uh, would you mind commenting on the resurgence of white supremacy among the far right today? And let me let me add to that. Um, um, much of what we're seeing seems like old world racism reemerging. The tactics, the narratives, the yeah. actions. Uh, the only difference is January 6th. We saw so much racism and hatred through the annals of history in books and videos and discussions, but there was never an insurrection on their own government. Yeah. And I want to add to that because you talk about W.B. Du Bois in one of your conversations. I want to bring that up. Uh, but can you comment on the resurgence of white supremacy among the far right today? Well, so again, the challenge is, is that these are deeply held bipartisan values, right? I mean, I just said a few minutes ago that one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? And so when you press the establishment hard enough, the left will stand up just as strongly and just as adamantly for these same values. Generally, the right is more explicit and the left is more implicit, but they both hold the same values, whether it's white supremacy or whether it's Christian nationalism. And so one of the things we see this in the January 6th insurrection, right, is imagine with me for a moment if President Obama did what Donald Trump did when he was in office. I promise you, he would have not only been impeached, he would have been removed from office and imprisoned by a bipartisan, unanimous vote of Congress. Agreed 100%. Other than we could have batted an eye. Agreed 100%. Right? The fact that we are a year and a half later, now just barely hearing the reports of a committee, and I said this on my social media over my second cup of coffee a few weeks ago, I don't think the Democrats have the courage to charge and arrest Donald Trump. I don't think they have the courage to do it. You know, because that would set in their minds a horrible precedent, right? When you have a nation that not only was started on a dehumanizing doctrine of discovery, but was founded by an insurrection which we, we literally were, right? This was the Declaration of Independence. It was an insurrection against Great Britain. That's right. And so if we start charging white people for insurrection, where's that going to end? So I personally don't think the Democrats have the courage to charge and arrest Donald Trump. And this is the problem. Because if he was not a white landowning male from the upper echelons of the 1%. If he was a person of color, 
or another marginalized person, he absolutely would be sitting in prison right now. And this is where we see it. So yes, it was it was it was the right that was moving in to do this, but the left is like, yeah, we're not gonna we're gonna scream about it and we're gonna throw up our hands and make a fuss, but we're not gonna do anything about it. I, I personally don't think that the, the Democrats have the courage to arrest Donald Trump. And it's because so. that would set a precedent that would end up hurting them. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I I'll say one last thing. The, the two party system, the Democrats and Republicans, their primary goal is to maintain the status quo. And they actually do that in partnership whether it's playing good cop, bad cop, whether it's explicit versus implicit, but they work together to maintain the status quo. And the status quo is built on racism, sexism, and white supremacy, right? So we got Donald Trump saying, make America great again. We have Hillary Clinton in 2016 saying America's great already, right? We have, we have um, Donald Trump doing his white supremacist um, Christian nationalist photo op in front of Ebenezer Church, right? We all have that that quote seared in our mind. Most people don't know this. After in 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 2021, there there was a, well they know this. There was a terrorist attack in um, in Afghanistan, and several of our service members were killed, and it was a it was a pretty brutal attack. And after that attack. President Biden made a statement, and I'm going to read to you what he said, okay? He said, to those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. He then went on to say, I want to thank the Secretary of Defense and the military leadership at the Pentagon, all the commanders in the field. I want to thank them for their unity from every commander and the objectives of this mission and the best way to move forward these objectives. And then he said, those who have served through the ages have drawn inspiration from the book of Isaiah. When the Lord says, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? And the American military has been answering for a long time. Here am I, Lord, send me. Here I am, send me. So according to, to Joe Biden, the American military is a prophetic arm of the Lord yeah. responding to the call of the Lord at a level on par with that of Isaiah the prophet. And no one said a word. The two parties hold the same values. They both absolutely embrace white supremacy. They both absolutely embrace Christian nationalism. There is very little difference between Democrats and Republicans, except the Democrats are implicit and the Republicans are explicit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I tell people about this all the time. If you think the Democratic Party is interested in giving you rights, it's going to be a long wait. It's going to be a very, very, very long wait. And this is one of the things I mean by the dangers of uh, rhetoric and verbiage that we are so used to, accustomed to hearing, that we never take the time to pause and actually think about the actual impact these words have when they're used in the context of wars and racisms and the deaths of people. We don't really take the time to consider the impact that these statements have. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats are so used to using the Bible to capture that group of voters, that block of voters, um, to assuage them to vote for whatever it is that they're trying to do in office. Um, let me use a little Bible here. Let me use some Christian lingo here uh, yeah. to make them feel comfortable, to feel as if they are not forgotten. But the danger is that when you take the word of God out of context and you use it for the sole purpose 
of assuaging people to do something that has nothing to do with godliness, this is what you end up with, a insurrection on January 6th. Not an insurrection, but an insurrection that no one is willing to hold you accountable for. Absolutely. There, there are two reasons why Trump is not in prison today. Part of the reason is the Republicans. The other part is the Democrats don't have the courage to actually do it. Yeah, agreed. 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 And, and 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 I like the way you put it. I don't think neither house has the courage to put him in prison for what he did. All of the evidence is there. Oh. We saw him mobilize the people. We saw him use the people. But, you know, um, I had on the show um, an author who talked about W.B. Du Bois's uh, uh, dark water essays. And in his dark water essays, uh, he talks about how uh, the people who are used to do the work of racism in America are the low class, unintelligent, undereducated, impoverished white people. Rich white people employ the low of their class to do the work of hating black people. They fill them with narratives that causes them to be upset and angry with other people of race and color. And they use them to commit crimes. And then when those crimes are committed, they don't even do anything to defend them, to get them out of prison, to get them out of jail. All of the persons that they caught who was, you know, in Nancy Pelosi's office, uh, people who were taking, you know, the, the lecterns and breaking out windows and, and just destroying property uh, in the Capitol, um, undereducated, underpaid, underappreciated white people. And all of them are sitting in prison. And the congressmen and the president who caused the riot, who paid for the riot, who made sure that money was given so people can have gas to get to D.C. to create this insurrection, none of them are held, none, none of them have been arrested. Ted Cruz has not been arrested. Um, Donald Trump is not going to be arrested. And this is the reality that we have to live in is that. When it comes to racism and hatred in this country, uh, the people who fuel the hate and who pay for the hate and who are the ones who are behind the scenes constructing the plans of hate, they will never see justice. And until we start calling out that rich 1% of America for the crimes like the Koch brothers, until we start calling them out for what they are doing in this country, we'll never be able to get to the root cause of what is happening. But your work allows us to see that the root cause is not just in, uh, you know, the White Citizens Councils or the KKK. This is not the root cause of it. These are just some of the field handlers of spreading this, you know, this rhetoric of hate and racism. Your book helps us to realize that the Christian church and, and well, the Christian church, period, is responsible for where we are as it as it as it as it deals with racism and hate and the dehumanizing of people. Yeah, one of the things I want to I want to share with you a link here because one of the things that I talk about a lot um, is and let me find it. Um, I'll put it into the the chat with you. We have to acknowledge right that the purpose of the Constitution, the reason it was written was to protect the interests of white landowning men. The constitution wasn't, it wasn't written to give justice to everybody. It wasn't written to give justice to people of color. It wasn't written to give justice to women. It was written to protect the interests of white landowning men. And until we address these things at a foundational level and actually make the changes we need to the founding document, we're never gonna be able to fix it. We're never going to get the the results that we want, and so I want to. I can't find this link right now. Hold on, I almost have it here. I actually went through. Here it is. A few years ago, I read the Constitution myself as an adult, and I was so appalled at how exclusive it got. Um, how exclusive it got so quickly that I actually started going through it with a strike through font. And um, let me just, hold on, let me give you one more set of text here. I went through with a strike-through font and I took out 
the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacy. I didn't change balance of powers. I didn't change checks and balances. I just removed the racism and the sexism and the white supremacy from the foundation. And I said to start saying to people, if we can make these changes, we don't need to amend the constitution, right? Because the amendment puts a footnote at the end saying what you read earlier should be changed. We don't need to amend it. We need to edit it. So we have 51 gender specific male pronouns in the constitution. We have to edit those and change them to gender neutral or proper nouns. Right, we have clauses that keep slavery legal in prison. Our counts Africans as three fifths of a person. Our specifically excludes natives. Right, that language just needs to be removed from this document. There's not a corporation in the world that exists today that's running off of bylaws written in and in the language of the 1500s or the the the, the 1800s. Right, but sure. we're still governing our nation and doing Supreme Court cases, not only based on these documents written back then, but our most of our Supreme Court um, justices adhere to what's called originalism, which is to interpret the Constitution in the mindset of the original authors. For sure. And so and so I, I put out this this uh, edited version of the Constitution. And I, I said if if we can make these changes, again, we're not changing checks and balances. We're not changing balance of powers. We're simply removing the racist, the sexist, and the white supremacist language from the document. If we can actually start with a constitution that actually can apply to all the people, then we have some hope of writing and enforcing laws that are much more just and even equitable. But in its current form, in its current version, the Constitution is incapable of equally distributing justice because that's not what it was written to do. So I want to ask and you. Yes, you can actually share that. You can share that with, with the audience if you'd like to. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I wanted to make sure because I wanted to get this out. Um, Again, I have a colleague, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Diana Watkins Dickerson, um, who is a rhetorician, uh, an amazing rhetorician. And, uh, and this is some of the things that she does on her own podcast, uh, having these conversations um, that help us to identify the dangers of rhetoric that is fueling the narrative of what is to be believed. And so thank you for this. I wanna ask you uh, now, how much of what we're seeing in society is influenced by the power of imagination? And this is something you talk about. Uh, let me find it here. Um, yeah, I got it marked here. Um, you talk about this. Uh, I believe this is still chapter one. Uh, you talk about this on page, if I can get this open here, page 27. You talk about the power of imagination. And I want to read the text. That um that struck that stuck out for me. You say here on page twenty seven, the human imagination serves as a powerful tool in the construction of social systems. Imagination shapes the worldview and the subsequent actions of an individual, and can be internalized in the individual within social reality. In the same way, social imagination has the capacity to profoundly influence and shape society. The construction and preservation of social reality depends on the power of imagination. Yeah. So a lot of this writing on imagination is a material that came, that Sung Chan put into the book. And this is some of the things that he brought into this. So he can probably give a much more um, expert answer to this than I can. But having worked with him and, and having pondered this stuff on my own, you know, you can't do something, create something, live something out unless you can imagine it. And so when you have this imagination that is rooted in these white supremacist, racist, sexist ideals, and then especially, because one of the things that, we, one of the, the, the crux of where we're going with this is how 
all of these diseased imaginations eventually get empowered and even further diseased by our theological imagination, right? So if you have a diseased social imagination or an individual imagination, and then you kind of boost that with a diseased theological imagination, it only expands the, the opportunity to be destructive because now you're basically empowering and you're like turbo boosting it with your theological imagination because now you're not just imagining things that you might be able to possibly do or might be within your grasp, but now you're imagining things that are within a divine grasp and with a, with a divine reach. And so this is where when we have these, these very systemic and foundational ideas like a doctrine of discovery, like... Um, white supremacy and all these other things that we have at our foundations, these are the things that feed these imaginations. And when they are empowered or boosted by a, the a diseased theological imagination, it makes them even more dangerous. And so what we're trying to point out here is how this brokenness exists at all of these different levels. And because it exists in the theological, in the divine, right, this is what makes it even worse. And this, I'll even go back to what we just read, the quote by Joe Biden um, about Isaiah and the U.S. military, right? So when he now sees himself as commander in chief, not only of the United States' military, but a military that he believes has been ordained by God, the potential for danger there is exponentially higher, right? And so, so this is where, when, when we see this, this, these ideas kind of infecting all the different levels of our society's imagination, of our individual imagination, our societal imagination, and our theological imagination, at every level, it just, it just gets more and more dangerous. Um, and so I think this is where we, we have to be aware of it so that we can actually catch ourselves before we, we do something incredibly damaging. You know, I would, I would actually be very afraid. I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. You know, Joe Biden said the reason he's not putting a single boot of the U.S. military in Ukraine is because he understands that would elevate the conflict with Russia and he knows Russia would respond probably with their nuclear arsenal. But then he also knows himself and our country, which is he would then have to respond nuclearly. And so to prevent that, he said, I'm not going to put a single boot in, of the U.S. military in Ukraine so that doesn't happen. No, so it's comforting that he's at least aware of that. It would be much more comforting if he just was able to step out of that worldview as a whole. You know, and this is the challenge we face as Americans, right, which is we truly believe that if we can't win a war, then the world shouldn't exist, right? This is what we believe. This is why we have so many nuclear weapons. It's like, well, if we can't win, we're just going to destroy this thing for everybody. Um, and, and that's, that's the American that's mentality. A dangerous narrative. What? That's 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 a, that's a very dangerous narrative. That is a very dangerous reality of truth because we have so many previous acts of destruction. That proves exactly what you just said. Yeah. The bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima um, was the ultimate uh, example of what you just got finished saying. If we can't win this war, we're just going to destroy it for everybody because, you know, the, the mythological belief of what America is supposed to be and what America stands for. We, we, we can't abide by not being able to win a war. And I want to add that I think the reality for most of what we've seen in terms of the Afghan war was that, you know, uh, if we can't win a war, we're going to do very little to help anybody else to be successful. 
um, if we can't Americanize the rest of the world, then yeah. we're not going to do anything to help other people to be successful. We're not going to do anything that's going to stop, you know, what's happening in other countries that we know to be wrong because truth is we won't even stop it here in America. Yeah. Um, I heard a and sermon recently by someone that I love and admire. Um, his name is um, Reverend Terry K. Anderson. He passes the Lily Grove uh, Missionary Baptist Church in Houston. And he said recently, May 29th, actually, uh, in his sermon, when God no longer hears, um, um, I'm having a trouble today uh, remembering stuff today. I don't know why. Um, oh, when God no longer hears thoughts and prayers. That was the title of his sermon. When God no longer hears thoughts and prayers. And in, in that sermon, he made a very bold statement. One of the reasons why you don't see white people, uh, you see white people calling for abortion to be ended is because they realize that they are the minority in this country and they need white young babies to be born, particularly white young males to be born so that they can lift their numbers and so they can be in the majority and assume the power that they fear they are losing. And that's a, that's a, that's a reality of the fight that I never really paid attention to um, because there's so many different narratives out there yeah. uh, where people are saying, you know, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-choice. Um, and I've heard so many, you know, arguments in light of the Uverde massacre, uh, the Uverde shooting uh, at the school in Uverde. Um, you know, if you're so pro-life, why aren't you calling out these perpetrators of school shootings and mass shootings, why aren't you so willing to put together a gun legislative bill that's going to actually do some good, that's going to stop 18-year-olds from being able to buy high-powered automatic rifles like the yeah. AR-15? Um, <sighs> yeah. One, one of the challenges we face as a country is, and I'll, I'll talk about the, the Roe versus Wade and the abortion issue, which is our constitution in the way it's written does not give us the tools to have a discussion about the value of life. Yeah. So this is why abortion is the litmus test for Supreme Court justices. Yeah. Because when it comes down to a ruling on abortion, there's nothing in the Constitution that gives us the tools to make a to, to make a decision on that. So it's entirely up to the whim of the justice. Yeah. So we've made it the litmus test. Where do you stand on this issue? Because the Supreme Court is are the, the Constitution is actually silent on it. The Constitution doesn't advocate for the value of any life. It, 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 it's it's very silent on that. Um, and so this is where, and I, I've done other speeches on this too, where the debate we're having, which we call the pro-life and pro-choice debate, that's not the debate we're having, right? The debate we're having as a nation is who gets to control the female body. That's the debate we're having. And if we truly valued life right at every level we would approach these conversations in a radically different way than we are currently and so this is where we, we have to we have to learn to recognize that the things we're told we're debating are not actually what we're debating i would actually what we're actually debating when we uh, debate abortion is white male Christian supremacy. Yes. That's what we're debating. That's exactly right. And we have to reframe that conversation and point out how even our founding documents don't give us the tools to have that conversation in a good manner if we're ever going to get to a better place with it. And, you know, and, you know, this is just a thought, you know, the most feared... <laughs> Well, I believe it to be so. One of the most feared persons on the face of this planet is a black man. Um, then, but then that's just reflecting the struggles of being black in America for me. 
the most feared person in America is an educated man. Uh, that is a reality for anybody who's not white. But I think the most feared person in America is a woman because only a woman has the power to reproduce life. And in order to control what is to be reproduced, this is the reason why we have a Roe versus Wade. Um, white old men are afraid of women not producing enough white male babies to help them to stay in power. Um, it's, it's, it's the proponents of mass shootings in America since 1982, 62% has been white males. Yeah. You can, you can go on to the Department of Justice and find that. That is a real statistic. That yeah. since 1982, mass shootings in this country have been done by white males. All of the shootings that we have had at schools, white males. The issues as it relates to gun legislation, legislation, the holdup has been white males. And I'm from the South, Mr. Charles. I'm born and raised in North Carolina. So guns was nothing foreign to me. Yeah, we shot guns on Fourth of July. We shot guns just because, you know. I have uncles who, you know, family relatives who were really cousins, but more like uncles, who took me and my brother outside while the women were in the house. You know, my mom and my aunts were having conversations that we didn't need to be a part of. So, you know, my uncle Doug would take me and my brother outside and teach us man stuff, how to cut grass and how to stay in the lanes and. And <laughs> how to shoot a gun and how to clean a gun. Um, I own guns. I, I'm a responsible gun owner. I keep my guns locked up. Uh, I go to the range when I have time because I appreciate, you know, the aesthetics of being able to use the firearm properly. Uh, I'm from the South. Guns, yeah. guns is what we do. But I'm not interested in taking another human being's life just because you picked on me because I don't have nice clothes. Or because you said something to me that I don't like, or because my mom and dad didn't hug me enough, and so I'm going to wipe out other children at a school, or because I'm a racist and I don't like your race and I'm going to kill you. I'm going to walk into your Bible study. I'm going to sit with you for an hour and listen to you talk about the love of God and the love of Jesus, and yeah. then I'm going to commence to killing you. Um, that's a serious problem in this country. And if we're not really ready to have the conversation, then I think we ought to at least put some laws in place that's going to protect human life. And you can't say that you care about human life if you're not willing to at least do that. So when we look at the Second Amendment, right, we, we talk about the influence of the Doctrine of Discovery on our country. And I already pointed out how the Constitution starts with the words, we the people, and then it goes on to define people as essentially white landowning men. So when we look at the Second Amendment, which was, you know, a part of the, the first wave of amendments that went into the Constitution, it's actually a fairly simplistic amendment. It says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So we can see very clearly right here where the left and the right scream at each other, right? So the left he reads the first part, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So this is where the left says we need to regulate guns. We have the right to regulate guns. And then we have the right, which reads the second half, which says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So they said, yeah, you can't, you can't regulate this. We can do whatever we want with them. Now, what's fascinating about this. So when this amendment was written, right, this was when the constitution was written, 1780s and 90s, the militia, a Lay persons are a, 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 a public army, a volunteer army, existed for two primary reasons after the Revolutionary War. We weren't in much danger of being invaded. So what it existed for was, A, to protect our settlers on the frontiers from the merciless Indian savages, and B, to help slave owners round up their escaped enslaved people. That was the purpose of the militia when this amendment was written. Then the second half, the right of the people 
the people. That's a, a repeating word, phrase from the preamble, we the people. Remember, our founding fathers defined people as white landowning men. The right of the people to keep and bear arms. The Second Amendment wasn't written to give people of color the right to bear arms. This is why the NRA is silent when it comes to um, people of color's issues with gun rights and things like that. They're much more silent than they are with white people. And so one of the things that I would say, right, if we're going to actually address this at a foundational level, is we just have to get rid of the Second Amendment. I would argue our nation is not mature enough to handle a constitutionally protected right to bear arms. And even if we did, the phrasing and the way this was written is so dripping with white supremacy that it's almost unredeemable. Well, you know, and so, I, and so I would say, yes, people can have guns just like they can have a car, but you got to regularly demonstrate that you can operate that car safely. You have to have insurance for your car. You have to you know, prove that you can use it right. And this is the challenge is, is that we have this amendment that is dripping with white supremacy and racism written in the racist and sexist language of the founding fathers. And it was written to protect white people from savages and to allow them to capture their enslaved peoples who are running away. And it wasn't written to to give this right equally to all people, regardless of race. And and that's the part that I like is I like the way you put that. Excuse me, <clears throat> that we need to take it out of the Constitution because we're not mature enough to handle it. And that is a reality because if you look at all of the actions that have taken place in this country, we have not shown any level of maturity in handling. Guns, gun conversations, gun issues, gun legislation. I mean, all of the states do what they want to do. I have lived and pastored in three different states, Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. It is easy to own a gun in those three states. And because those states border each other so closely, they have what they call straw purchases, where you can live in PA but purchase guns in in in. in the next city of Youngstown, if you will. You can live in Pennsylvania. I live in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. If I wanted to, I can purchase a gun in Youngstown, Ohio, and not have to have any difficulty in getting that gun. I can, the governor here in, the governor in Ohio signed a law during, during COVID-19, during the pandemic, uh, which the pandemic is still a reality, let me just say that. But during the pandemic, uh, we're, you know, carrying a handgun openly now is, is, is more than legal. I mean, you could carry a long gun, a long handgun, like a shotgun in the open, but now you can conceal carry. It's just open. It's wide range. And again, we're not mature enough to handle these kinds of conversations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mark Charles, the author of Unsettling Truths. I'm going to take a quick break for one of our sponsors. We're going to come back with one more question for him. I want to thank you now for uh, taking us to school today. This has been, I haven't been in the classroom since 2015. Thank you for putting me back in the classroom. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation. I'm very glad we could have this time to talk. Yes, sir. We'll be right back. Recently, God opened the door for J.P. Moore Mortuary and Cremation Services to expand into the Madison, Florida area, allowing us to provide stellar yet affordable services to families in need, families who are looking to honor the life of their loved one in the customs and traditions of our cultural experience. J.P. Moore Mortuary and Cremation Services offers compassionate and courteous service with unmatched satisfaction and a professional staff that can serve your family in a difficult time with dignity. The top 11 reasons why families call J.P. Moore Mortuary and Cremation Services are that we offer funeral services, cremation services, we have an on-premise chapel, we have J.P. Silk Creations, our on-premise florist, we offer grief counseling, we have 24-hour on-call service, at-home arrangements, out-of-town services, 
We have digital casket display. We offer air flight shipping. And we have reasonable and competitive pricing with a complimentary notary public. Spreading sunshine at the sunset of life. J.P. Moore Mortuary and Cremation Services. The mortician who cares more. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. I have with me Mark Charles, the co-author of Unsettling Truths, the ongoing dehumanizing legacy of the doctrine of discovery. You need to go to Amazon, go to the link I posted on my Facebook page, get you a signed copy of the book. I will be giving me one um, because I love to write in my books. I don't like to dog in the pages, but I like to put my little sticky notes in here and pull out my uh, my pens, my red pens, and, and underline and write in the margins. Uh, but I like to have a signed copy on the shelf so I can say, yeah, I know Mark Charles. He's been on the show. We're friends. We talked about this. Get the book. And I've received several texts uh, from colleagues, uh, other pastors who are excited to get this book. Uh, what you and Su Chan Ra has done uh, as a person of color, you have given us another piece that helps us along the journey of why we do what we do. Yeah. In 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 the fight for racial equality, social justice, um, even from a biblical and theological viewpoint. I'm a proud graduate of Payne Theological Seminary, um, uh, the oldest African-American conservative theological seminary in the United States with an Afrocentric view of teaching the Bible and teaching theology. Um, and the education that I received in my Master's Divinity program at Payne um, has allowed me to become the thinker that I am today because I was exposed to the truth and I was giving facts. I wasn't given just somebody's opinion. I wasn't given a Bible verse and said, hey, this is what it is. Uh, I was given an opportunity to read and to research and to write for myself. And so this is a sacred book to me. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Uh, for writing this book and for making it available. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, and if people, as you said earlier, people want to get a signed copy of that, they're on my website at wirelesshogan.com. So. Absolutely. Please go to his website. Uh, I'm gonna, Again, I'm going to post it here. You can get a signed copy of Unsettling Truths uh, by visiting wirelesshogan.com. Click the link. It's on my Facebook page. Get you a signed copy. I want to ask you this question. Um what do you mean by the pervasive power of Christendom worldview on page 183? Yeah, so that is a very good question. I'm going to just make sure I'm referencing it properly here as I bring it up here. When we talk about this worldview of Christendom and what we're talking about there, right? We started this, you, we started this, segment with you showing about the the denomination that was repudiating the doctrine of discovery um and one of the challenges with the doctrine of discovery is that it's a theological doctrine and it came from the church and so there's a wave of churches who are studying the doctrine of discovery and they're labeling it as heresy and they're repudiating it, which is all fine and good. The challenge is, is that most of these denominations don't acknowledge that this theological doctrine has actually become embedded into our nation's legal system. And so when you repudiate something theologically, you're also repudiating it legally. And this is where it becomes a problem. And so the story that we show in this, in our, we, we tell them in this book is, it was, this was at Standing Rock, right? Which was the, the protest um, 
about the pipeline that they were building through a, a native reservation and there was a massive protest. This is probably three or four years ago. And um, they got a lot of publicity and there was a lot of people that showed up for it. And they had a sacred fire at the middle of this camp. And one day at that sacred fire, several leaders and, and members of Christian organizations and denominations came together and they read statements of their denominations or of their churches repudiating the doctrine of discovery. I traveled to Standing Rock. It was a, a week or so, two weeks after that event took place. I wasn't there for that event, but I heard about it. And there was a lot of excitement around it. And I was there a few weeks later, and I met with the person who organized it. And he was telling me about it with a lot of excitement. And I said, that sounds good. This sounds very interesting. I, I'm curious if, as these churches and these leaders read their statements of repudiation, did they return any land to the native nations that was stolen using this doctrine of discovery? And I was informed, no, that didn't happen. No, no land was returned. I said, well, that makes sense. This probably came together quickly. It would have been a lot of logistical work to bring that all together with a land return. So that makes sense. But I'm curious. And I, I, I talked then about my TEDx talk and how the doctrine of discovery gets embedded into the legal precedent for land titles and how that precedent gets referenced by the Supreme Court as recently as 2005. And I said, so when you you're, these leaders read these statements of repudiation, did they commit to the native nations that were there that should they ever find themselves in court regarding sovereignty or control over these lands, did they commit that they would not defend themselves in court because their only defense would be this doctrine of discovery, which they've now repudiated? And I was informed, no, no such commitments were made. And I said, oh, so then this was just a photo op, right? I mean, it sounded nice, exactly. words were exchanged, but you didn't actually do make the commitments necessary to acknowledge that you're not just repudiating a theological document, you're repudiating a legal document that has legal ramifications. And I get approached by churches frequently who want to study and look at repudiating their doctrine of discovery and bring me into conversations. And I actually tell churches, and I'm like, before you repudiate it, you need to make sure that you're willing to accept the legal consequences of that. And if you're not, then please don't repudiate it. If this is just a photo op, if this is just something symbolic, do something else than repudiate this document because you're actually gonna do more harm by repudiating it and then not accepting the legal ramifications of that than to not repudiate it, period. Um, and this is this is where our nation runs into problems, right? And even since then, right? So there was a there was a court case in 2020 where um, it was McGirt versus the state of Oklahoma. And what most people don't know is that if a Native American commits a crime against another Native American on reservation land, the jurisdiction for that crime falls to the federal courts, not to the state courts. And so McGirt, a Native man, was committed of a pretty horrendous crime in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he was tried, brought to trial for that crime in the in the 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 Oklahoma State Court. And he lost the case. He was found guilty. And he appealed because he said, based on treaty, Tulsa, Oklahoma is on reservation land. And so I should have been tried in a federal court and not in a state court. And so um, he appealed and the appeal made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so in 2020, the Supreme Court heard that case and they delivered their opinion in the summer of 2020. This was during the campaign that I was running. And it was Neil Gorsuch, who was actually one of the better 
legal minds on the Supreme Court regarding uh, Native American or Indian law because of where he served in Colorado for a number of years. And he, he was actually heard a lot of cases regarding Indian law cases. And so he wrote this opinion. Now, what was at what was on trial, what was a question in this case was, did the state of Oklahoma have the right to basically dis, to, to take away the reservation land or did they not? Because the state of Oklahoma said, so basically McGirt said the, the treaty with the federal government established this as reservation land and um, the state of Oklahoma said, well, we've never treated it as reservation land. And since then, the court has ruled it's not reservation land, so we don't have to treat it that way. And so the, what, it, what was at question was, had the reservation been disestablished in Tulsa, Oklahoma? And surprisingly, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of McGirt. It ruled against the state of Oklahoma. And it reminded the state of Oklahoma that neither the state nor the courts had the right to disestablish reservations. And so because of that, Tulsa, for judicial purposes, was still considered a reservation. And therefore, the, that case, along with numerous other cases, had to be retried in a federal court. Now, this was seen as a huge win for Indian country. And there were celebrations and people were, were talking about it. But the day the opinion came out, because I don't trust the Supreme Court, I actually read the entire opinion. And I found that while, yes, the Supreme Court did state that the, the state of Oklahoma did not have the legal right to disestablish the reservation, and the federal court the, the, they had, therefore hadn't been disestablished, they had some other comments that were very troubling. I want to just read part of this opinion to you. They said, to determine whether a tribe continues to hold a reservation, there is only one place we may look, the acts of Congress. This court long ago held that the legislature wields significant constitutional authority when it comes to tribal relations, possessing even the authority to breach its own promises and treaties. Only Congress can divest the reservation of its land and diminish its boundaries. So it's no matter how many other promises to a tribe the federal government has already broken, if Congress wishes to break the promise of a reservation, it must say so. History shows that Congress knows how to withdraw a reservation when it can muster the will. So while the court ruled that Tulsa for judicial purposes in 2020 was still reservation land because the state of Oklahoma and the courts did not have the right to disestablish it. The Supreme Court also undeniably stated that at any point it desires, Congress has the absolute right to break that treaty and there is nothing that will hold them accountable to it. Now, the problem with that is a treaty is not just one-sided, right? So if you have a treaty with the, the Creek Nation and you say, okay, if you give up these lands in North Carolina or in Alabama or in Georgia and you move to this reservation we've established in Oklahoma, right? So there's two parts of the treaty. The U.S. government gained control of the land where they leave, and the tribe gets possession um, of the lands on the reservation. So if the treaty gets broken, not only does that mean the reservation gets disestablished, but it also technically means the U.S. government's right to the lands that they gained access to through that treaty is now lost. But that's not the way the U.S. government sees it. So they see that they have the right to break treaty and disestablish a reservation with a native nation whenever the Congress can muster the will. But they also don't need to give up the lands that the U.S. government took control of where the native nation were displaced from. You know, <laughs> let me just say this. 
thank you for today because I really didn't know. I never know how the conversation is going to go. This has probably been one of the longer conversations I've done in a good while. Um, and I'm grateful that we have this conversation recorded and saved um, for future references because you are giving so much rich information. And I want to go back to the segment where you talked about the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. It is so important that people understand this is not the time for photo ops and for um, written articles or public stances just to say, I'm sorry, um, because that has that is what the U.S. Congress has done to all of the indigenous people in this country. Um, everybody has received an apology. The only race of people who has not received anything in terms of compensation or uh, reparations as African Americans. There's there's been a statement in Congress where they apologize for slavery. No U.S. president has ever apologized for slavery, and probably no U.S. president is going to apologize for slavery in America. Um, there has been money given to uh, Japanese internment camp survivors. There has been money given to uh, certain Native American tribes in this country. There has been money given to Holocaust survivors. But there has been no money given to survivors of slavery uh, and their descendants. And we have seen enough apologies, enough grandstanding. We've seen enough repudiation of things of the past. But as you so eloquently put, if you're going to repudiate something, then you have to take on the legal responsibility that comes with that repudiation. And so I want to thank you for that. Um, because I hope the message that people will receive is to stop taking photo opportunities and calling it justice, yeah. if that makes sense. Yes. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Again, this has been one amazing conversation, and I hope that I can schedule with your assistant, Melissa, so we can do part two, uh, so we can delve into more of your book, in the meantime, I want to invite uh, all of our listeners to go uh, share this conversation with your friends, share it with your Bible study group, share it with your reading groups, uh, invite Mark Charles to your virtual conversations, uh, or if you're in the D.C. area, invite him to your churches so that you can have this conversation um, in a more rich format, in a rich setting. Um, uh, I believe this is good Bible study material. Um, and I want to invite you to go to his website, uh, wirelesshogan.com. Purchase your copy of Unsettling Truths, the Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. You will not be disappointed. Uh, please give us uh, your final goodbyes as we prepare to end the show. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be with you today and to be with your audience. I really appreciate this conversation. I'm going to put a, a link into the private chat, which I have access to. If people are interested in learning more about or supporting the work that I'm doing, I actually have a site on Patreon um, where people can subscribe to my work on Patreon, um, and there's a lot of benefits accessible there. I'm also very active on social media. I'm on YouTube, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok. Uh, there's a lot of places where you can find me. I'm Wireless Hogan on most of those places, including on Patreon. So W-I-R-E-L-E-S-S-H-O-G-A-N. I regularly drink my second cup of coffee and have conversations about these things on my YouTube channel, my Facebook page. Um, and I'm doing a lot to engage this publicly. So uh, you can go to my website, which is wirelesshogan.com. You can get buy signed copies of my book there, or you can um, uh, invite me to come and speak at your event. I'm very open to doing any of those things. But uh, I'm mostly really trying to get our nation to deal with its history and to find a way to move ourselves forward in a way that is both healthy and productive, right? I don't want to just kind of rehash the same things over and over. I want to move forward with some really in-depth um, uh, work that we need to do. So I thank you for inviting me onto, your, onto your, uh, your show today. It's been an honor to talk with you. It's been an honor to meet your audience. And I look forward to having a follow-up conversation at some point in the future. Absolutely. You will be back. Uh, this is the kind of conversations I live for 
uh, Mark Charles, I can't thank you enough. Um, when I saw you on, I knew you, I already followed you on Twitter. Uh, and you had recently, maybe a couple of weeks ago, had posted something. And I said, oh, yeah, let me try one more time to see if I can get in touch with him. And when you responded, I was like, yeah, that's what I needed. Uh, that was the that was the good thing I needed for my day that day. Uh, I was like, yeah, he hit me back. And uh, and I was able to communicate with your assistant, Melissa. Thanks to her uh, for making making this possible. I really appreciate her. Um, again, people, go get the book. Um, this book was very helpful to me in the pandemic when I was living in North Carolina. Um, and I look forward to part two engaging more with you. And I think we can bring, hopefully we can get a hold of uh, Dr. Suchan Ra. Uh, hopefully we can get both of you at the same time on yeah. the show and we can have this conversation, uh, a part two follow up to this conversation. But again, thanks again. I really appreciate you so very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and have gone that. Thank you so much. Brothers and sisters, as always, Conversation with Faith Leaders goal is to bring real intellectual, factual conversation uh, so that we can discuss it here. Things that are happening within society, things that are going on in the world. I always look forward to being able to have these conversations with this audience, uh, to bring in persons who have something to say uh, and not just another opinion. And so please continue to support Conversation with Faith Leaders. Uh, because of my pastoral work, I don't get the opportunity to engage in the weekly conversations, but I do look forward to bringing um, each month some form of conversations that I think will be beneficial and helpful uh, to those who support this channel. Uh, as always, I try to end with the thought, beloved, as I wrestle with the pervasiveness of Kingian thought regarding our advancement within society, I struggle with our contrived reality versus our lived reality. For most of us, we have been whitewashed with our temporary social climb by the fleeting moments of financial obtainment and dubious admission into certain social spheres that we have forgotten that sometimes a false pretense is a clever design to knit the net of darkness. Many of us have been fooled by the illusion of equality and progress resulting in a negative impact on our collective social progression. Sadly, we've forgotten that if we are going to make it, we must do so together. This has been Conversations with Faith Leaders. My name is Brandon A.A.J. Davis, founder of Content Writing Service and Conversation with Faith Leaders. And I invite you to watch us again next time right here on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, as always, stay militantly minded and spiritually grounded.